Now it's with great pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker today, NRC's Chairman Christine L. Savinicki. The Honorable Christine Savinicki was designated Chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission by President Donald J. Trump on January 23, 2017. She was sworn in for her second term as a commissioner to a term ending on June 30, 2017, and her previous term as a commissioner began on March 28, 2008. Ms. Savinicki has enjoyed a distinguished career as a nuclear engineer at the U.S. Department of Energy and as a policy advisor in the U.S. Senate, advancing policies and initiatives regarding national security, science, technology, energy, and the environment. She has served on a number of expert advisory panels and received the presidential citation of the American Nuclear Society for her contributions to U.S. nuclear policy. She is a graduate of the University of Michigan, Big Ten Tournament Champions, and number seven seed. Uh, I think you might want to look at them if you're filling out a bracket. So I would like to introduce for her ninth Rick and her first as chairman of the NRC, the Honorable Christine Savinica. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. I want to begin by also extending my thanks to the NRC staff that have had to adjust the schedule over the course of this week. In my mind, I've taken to calling this the quick Rick because it is going to be a day and a half. So um, I'm, I'm very appreciative for everyone's patience, but they really have gone above and beyond to make sure that we could accommodate so much of the program. So I'm very, very grateful for the long hours that they've been putting in so far this week. I'm very pleased to take part in this year's regulatory information conference. I extend my thanks to each of you for attending this session and also to those who might be tuning into the webcast, which might be a few additional people given the change in schedule. I want to add my thanks to the many NRC employees who make this conference possible. As Bill noted, it's a tremendous undertaking and it's fueled by the hard work of the NRC staff and the NRC staff also who volunteer to just uh, take part in making all of this possible. And it is one of the reasons that we are able to put on this successful conference. I also would like to acknowledge our many colleagues in attendance joining us from across the country and around the world. Thank you for traveling the distances required to join us here this week. To those of you whom I've met or spoken with or have welcomed me into the, your nuclear facilities over the course of the past year, I thank you for adding to my journey of continuous learning and for sharing your experiences with me. In the time since I stood before you at the RIC last year, I have completed my visits to the remaining U.S. nuclear power plants that I had not previously visited. And it's not a particularly impressive achievement as far as I'm concerned because it took me nine years to complete the task, but what I have been impressed by are the thousands of women and men who work at these plants, whether in operations, engineering, maintenance, security, or management. They are an impressive set of individuals, and I'm grateful for their daily contribution to the safety, security, and energy resiliency of this country. As I visited not only their plants, but the communities where they live and work, I was reminded of how we can measure the quality of our lives by what we give back to our families, our communities, and each other. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of our important partners from other federal and state agencies within the United States, as well as the many international colleagues who are joining us this week. The NRC's critical relationships with other government entities and collaboration on lessons learned with our international counterparts facilitate the effective achievement of our mission. Thank you for taking the time to be here, and in some cases, for agreeing to be a presenter at one of our technical sessions. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the presence of my commission colleagues, Commissioners Barron and Burns. Good morning to you both. As we go about our work, both individually and collectively, I'm grateful to serve along two such, alongside two such fine individuals, perhaps also in some small way, we might serve as an example of what is possible when people with different perspectives and sometimes differing views unite nonetheless in a spirit of collegiality and respect guided by our commitment to the organization that we serve. 
This is my ninth RIC speech, and at the end of this month, I will begin my 10th year of service on this commission. But this year, for the first time, I address the conference while designated as chairman. I'm grateful to President Trump for having resided the confidence in me to serve in this capacity during this period. I will give my full measure of effort to carrying forward capably with the responsibilities placed on me. More directly to the NRC staff, I want to say that we know each other, we have worked together for a very long time, and I'm very humbled to serve as your chairman. And this much has not changed. As chairman, I will continue to serve you, the commission, and the collective work we do, steadfast in the belief that we can continue to make an impact together. My prepared remarks this year will be brief. I want to leave some time for questions. The remarks of our Executive Director for Operations, Victor McCree, will follow mine, and he will provide a more in-depth presentation of various agency activities and efforts. Therefore, I will not cover the same ground. As has been mentioned, there are individuals circulating in the aisles who can collect question cards if you want to pass those down the row. Now, as a commissioner, it seemed that one of my principal tasks at the RIC was to tell a joke. I think I'm still allowed to do this as chairman as long as I make very clear that my colleagues do not provide either an express or implied endorsement of this joke. Um, this joke is kind of special to me, and I actually brought the card with me. This, this joke was provided on a question card last year, and it's labeled, in a very descriptive way, a joke for the commissioner's use, uh, in case I didn't understand that it was a joke for my use. Um, <laughs> And so to the person who submitted it, which is, there's no attribution on here if you're here, this year, yes, I did save your card in my desk drawer for an entire year. Uh, I also want to note that I am a nuclear engineer uh, by training, so I'm allowed to make this joke. So here goes. How many nuclear engineers does it take to change a light bulb? Two, one to change the light bulb and one to find a place to store it for 100,000 years. Somebody clapped. That's amazing. I don't think I thought I'd get. Oh, it's the person. Mr. Dean says it's the person who gave me the card last year. And that could well be. Okay. Well, I've reached a stage in my life where I read obituaries recreationally. So now the people laughing at that are the people who do the same thing. The people not laughing think that I'm very weird. But trust me, I think at a certain stage in life, uh, you may find yourself doing the same thing. I think for me, I'll put it under the heading of research in terms of what is a life well lived look like when it's reflected on after it's over and it's summarized in just a few paragraphs. In this vein, I was reading a, a newsletter a few months back from the North America Mongolia Business Council, which is actually a newsletter I get. Um, included in the newsletter was a tribute to a vice chairman of the council uh, Mr. Uh, James uh, Peter or Pete Morrow, who had passed away and had had a, a big impact on the organization. Now, I did not know this individual, but the tribute in memoriam that was written uh, to him in the newsletter made a very deep impression on me. It read in part as follows. Pete believed that every problem, no matter how large or daunting, had an ethical solution if only we work hard enough to find it and work even harder to implement it. He inspired, motivated, and led others by work and example to embrace a muscular optimism towards change. Although brilliantly pragmatic, Pete always recognized that change was a sedimentary process of consensus requiring unrelenting persistence, patience, and persuasion. Whatever he did and wherever he went, he kept his conscience for his guide. He was the living truth of the proposition that one man can make a difference. Now, when I think about my particular view of what kind of skills best serve us to succeed in a changing world, the core truths stated here about Pete Morrow, for me, cover it almost completely. And for those of us who work in the realm of public policy, I think it speaks to those core truths very clearly. The author of the tribute reminds us that solutions will generally elude us, 
unless we work hard enough to find them and harder still to implement them. We are reminded also that the means to inspire, motivate, and lead others come principally through our own hard work and the example we set for others. We are reminded that a muscular optimism towards change might serve us well in this purpose. Finally, the author of the tribute warns us that change can be a sedimentary process and that it will likely require persistence, patience, and the application of the somewhat vanishing art of persuasion. I believe for the NRC the principles of good regulation, independence, openness, efficiency, clarity, and reliability form a central part of the fabric of our truth. Our responsibilities as a regulator include working effectively with stakeholders, clearly communicating our requirements, and providing regulatory outcomes and information in an efficient manner. In a changing world, our mission remains unchanged, but our means to achieve this mission must be continually optimized, adapted, and evolved based on changing conditions and expectations. How is the NRC adapting and optimizing? The NRC remains focused on and committed to delivering our safety and security mission in an efficient, effective, and agile manner, but this in no way implies contentment with the status quo. Our public outreach to and engagement with those we regulate, public policymakers, and the broader range of interested stakeholders continues to provide valuable insights to inform and shape many ongoing NRC program changes and enhancements. These insights are continually factored into the NRC's work. For example, in the area of backfitting, the Committee to Review Generic Requirements, or CRGR, has held public meetings, one as recently as last month, to discuss the backfitting process. This past fall, the Commission directed the NRC staff to revise agency guidance concerning the consideration of cost where regulation is not necessary to ensure adequate protection of public health and safety, and in particular, in applying the compliance exception to the backfit rule. Specifically, the Commission directed the staff to ensure consistency with the Commission's direction in responding to the Executive Director for Operations tasking to the CRGR to review backfit guidance, training, and knowledge management. The Commission also directed the staff to provise, provide the revised backfitting guidance to the Commission for its approval. In response, the NRC staff is currently working to update the guidance that supports its regulatory and backfit analyses. Over the last year, the NRC has also enhanced the efficiency and predictability of the nuclear reactor licensing process, including clarifying management expectations for licensing reviews, improving discipline in the request for additional information process, enhancing collaboration with stakeholders to identify any, any unnecessary regulatory impediments to the advancement of digital technology, refining the decommissioning transition process, and developing further efficiencies in the review process for small modular and advanced reactor technologies. These and other efforts have supplemented the agency's project AIM activities through which, among other things, the NRC is implementing approximately $48 million in reductions associated with lower priority work that can be shed, performed with fewer resources, or performed with a different priority. In addition, planning continues towards the future consolidation of the Office of New Reactors with the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. Moreover, the NRC is working every day to, to sustain the improvements we have made to date and to identify additional opportunities to improve processes that accomplish our important mission in the most effective way. In the times to come, I'm personally confident that the NRC will be capable of rising to meet any set of challenges. After nearly nine years here, this is not just what I think, it is what I know. We know better than anyone else what we do well and what we can do better. It is my hope that we will continuously apply this knowledge, that we will continue to challenge ourselves and each other, and in so doing, that we will continue to set the standard of regulatory excellence. Having just used the word hope in that last sentence, I want to close on that subject 
and on the muscular optimism towards change referenced in Pete Morrow's uh, a tribute or obituary. Another subject I tend to address at the RIC in addition to jokes is literature. Since I last spoke at the RIC, the book that has made the deepest and most lasting impression on me is the book Becoming Wise by Krista Tippett. She has a very popular podcast, in case any of you subscribe. The, the final chapter of her book is entitled Hope, and it opens as follows. In a century of staggering open questions, hope becomes a calling for those of us who can hold it for the sake of the world. Hope is distinct in my mind from optimism or idealism. It has nothing to do with wishing. It references reality at every turn and reveres truth. It lives open-eyed and wholehearted with the darkness that is woven into the light of life and sometimes seems to overcome it. Hope, like every virtue, is a choice that becomes a pra practice that becomes spiritual muscle memory. It's a renewable resource for moving through life as it is, not as we wish it to be. She writes, my mind inclines now more than ever towards hope. I'm consciously shedding the assumption that a skeptical point of view is the most intellectually credible. Intellect does not function in opposition to mystery. Tolerance is not more pragmatic than love, and cynicism is not more reasonable than hope. Unlike almost every worthwhile thing in life, cynicism is easy. It judges things as they are, but does not lift a finger to try to shift them. Hope, in contrast, is an orientation, an insistence on wresting wisdom and joy from the endlessly fickle fabric of space and time. It is a privilege to hold something robust and resilient called hope, which has the power to shift the world on its axis. I thank you for your kind attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. So, Chairman, we do have a, a few questions. Uh, they're, they're pouring in. Um, so here's, here's the first one, and this is probably one that we could have anticipated. Um, although the NRC is an independent agency, what is impacted is expected from a number of the executive orders that have required the agency, for example, to create any new rule must eliminate two existing rules. Uh, the agency has been taking a very systematic look as, at the executive orders as they've been issued. As an independent agency, in the strictest sense, uh, we are uh, in some ways beyond the reach of the specific measures in some of those orders. But I think as an agency, we look also to the spirit and the intent of various executive orders. A, a curious story uh, about one of the uh, effects of, of becoming chairman was that I actually moved offices, so I was cleaning out a number of the reference materials I had accumulated, and I noticed uh, that I had executive orders on regulatory reform from President Obama. I had executive orders on regulatory reform themes from President Bush, and if I had been at NRC long enough, I'm sure I would have had some from the reinventing government era of President Clinton. So I, I think that this is not entirely new, that there have been themes of looking at greater efficiency and effectiveness in regulatory matters, and I think that the NRC has a, a continuous learning and improvement culture that, you know, we take that in. It may be in a strict sense that, that some of the measures are not uh, applicable to our agency, but uh, we can always be looking at the, the spirit and objective of those matters, and, and we do. That's the history of NRC. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so here's a question about the function of the commission affected by the two vacancies, and do you anticipate when the seats would be filled? It, I think uh, the administration is turning to vacancies at various boards and commissions in, a, in you know, as, as effectively and efficiently as they can. So I continue to work forward with an assumption that uh, recommendations and nominations for vacancies are likely in process, and I think in the coming months we would see that. Um, I, I don't find any diminishment in our ability to conduct our business at, at a 
at our three. You know, we look forward to the arrival of new members always, but um, it, I think that we've been moving through things with good efficiency and dispatch. Um, so the next question is, uh, I assume from one of our international uh, guests, you've noted the importance of sharing international best practices. What impacts will the NRC budget cuts and the new administration's foreign policy posture have on NRC's international cooperation and assistance activities in the coming years? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we are yet to see any specific uh, levels of impact, so um, some of these matters are still under evaluation. I think, though, that it's not unusual for uh, government departments and agencies to have to look at a, a tighter prioritization of activities. I I'm confident that uh, the NRC will continue to be able to pursue and collaborate on the most important measures uh, before us, and, and so I, I think if we have to look at some reprioritization, we'll do that. But I think the core of our collaboration will certainly continue. Okay. Um, so here's a question associated with uh, advanced reactors and new reactors. Do you believe that Part 52 has had the streamlining and efficiency improvements originally envisioned? I think that, that the agency has already engaged in at least one uh, lessons learned a snapshot in time of, of Part 52. We haven't gone all the way through the entirety of Part 52, so there's still some um, parts of it that have yet to be exercised as we move through the ITAC process at Vogel and Summer. And we've already looked, uh, again, at one lessons learned review. We've had some outcomes from that. I, I think, you know, I, I continue uh, to be supportive of the fact that both Part 50 and Part 52 are available depending on what an applicant would like to pursue. I think that depending on the attributes of the technology, there may be aspects of Part 50 that would be desirable. And, and so I think that it's uh, a strength of our regulatory framework that, that both options continue to exist. So expanding upon uh, discussions of, of new and advanced reactors, here's a question regarding, um, it was written specifically, but I think this could be broadened. How will the NRC view design certification activities uh, from different countries for non-light water reactor technologies, and is there any collaboration already underway? Well, on the margins of this conference, there are a tremendous number of meetings that we have with our international regulatory counterparts just yesterday. I know my colleagues and I met with a number of our colleagues. I discussed with at least uh, a couple of my international peers and from other countries uh, things that they're undertaking, perhaps uh, types of phased reviews and licensing. I, I think that the U.S. NRC will continue to look, to look with great interest at the efforts of other countries. Um, uh, Canada, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is, is undertaking some reviews of novel technologies right now, and, and I'm certain, as is our culture, we'll continue to cultivate whatever efficiencies that can be brought forward in that process. So I, I think we'll keep a close eye on that and continue to uh, collaborate, and, and where someone demonstrates something that we think would be very beneficial to the U.S., I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll look at that with interest. So I have a, a number of cards here uh, associated risk, with risk-informed approaches to regulatory uh, decision-making. Um, I'm going to read one that I think perhaps summarizes broadly what was in a lot of the, uh, the questions. But basically, the Commission's established policy is to apply risk-informed approaches to regulatory oversight. But in practice, licensees frequently experience some NRC staff preferring to rely on deterministic approaches, for example, FIRE PRA. What do you see as the biggest obstacle to fully embracing risk-informed principles throughout the agency, and how do you address what could be a cultural problem within the agency? Well, I think that the, uh, I observe that NRC's journey to risk-informed regulation is, is something that, that moves forward as a journey, and I think that to the extent that there are impediments or obstacles to truly risk-informed decision-making on any specific matter, it's likely that the challenges are specific to the, to the case that is before the agency. So I think it's very hard to generalize. There is a culture element. I'm sure that that's 
true, but um, I, I think that a lot of what we try to address is down in the specifics. So I, I think it's just continuing to evolve the regulatory framework to uh, risk inform the regulations themselves and then to drive the mindset and paradigm that people bring a truly risk informed approach to the work. Um, I think it's just a, a continuing evolution for NRC. I know it's been going on for some time, but I, I just see it as being more of a journey than something that happens in one fell swoop. And then I'll, I'll ask you one, one follow-up question uh, related to risk-informed initiatives. Um, what are your views in terms of what you consider to be the most pressing or important risk-informed initiatives that uh, the agency is or should pursue? I don't know if others would categorize this issue as a risk-informed issue, but um, digital instrumentation and control is something that is very front of mind for me, uh, and the imperative here is an urgency and timing imperative that has to do with general obsolescence issues um, that are somewhat unavoidable and are going to proceed whether or not the regulator can be uh, made to be comfortable with digital INC application. So I would, you know, without being overly critical of any particular NRC staff, I would say that I think we need to continue to put urgency on risk-informed approaches to digital INC. I know it requires a paradigm shift and it's hard uh, for our experts in some ways to be made comfortable, but I think that um, it's not a question of if we can become comfortable as a regulator, it's uh, it's it's a when statement about the fact that we just we really need to be able to develop workable paradigms for that. Okay. Um, okay. Some applause. It. Yeah. It's a digital well, we'll INC constituency out there, <laughs> or an obsolescence constituency. <laughs> I don't know which. Um, so this question is, uh, I guess, related to the agency's openness and transparency. But as as chair. Um, what would be, what is your uh, planned approach for uh, uh, dealing with or communicating with the press? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I know we have, uh, uh, what I observe is a very responsive uh, public affairs organization. I think they participate in a lot of our public meetings to make certain that um, the media's requests are responded to. I know often for media, uh, they need things to be um, communicated, not in so much of the heavy jargon that we have. I'm sure the, the public appreciates that as well. But uh, I know of instances where we put experts um, on the phone and, and they step through issues so that they can kind of be broken down into their component parts and made a bit more understandable. So when I read our press clippings, I feel like we're getting kind of layperson common sense, uh, the core messages are going out. So I, I observe that to be uh, effective. There is a point at which you lose some of the meaning and nuance. I think that can be difficult for scientists and technical experts to navigate. But I, I do think that we, we try to provide the training and background staff so that they understand that, that not everyone is in this field of profession. And so we need to try to make things understandable. Um, so here's a question. Uh, we have time maybe for a couple more, but I do want to ask this question. Uh, the individual wrote that uh, um, they noticed an absence of pop culture references in, in your speech. And so uh, the question is, uh, what do you think about uh, this season of Walking Dead? I um, can elaborate on this if, if you catch me outside of the session, but I, I would say that I, I'm behind one episode, so I'm not going to do any spoilers. Other people may be more behind than me. But I know it was a really rough start to the season, and I have, uh, like most people, a community of other viewers that, you know, we tweet, we text each other during the show and things like that. But I, I know some people dropped out just because of the brutality at the beginning of the season, but I just really, if you've got it on your DVR, hang in there because we got back to more of kind of the character journey later. It started out, it was rough to watch with Negan, almost tough. Um, but, you know, hang in there because the character stuff that you love, kind of maybe episode three or episode four of the season came back in. I do want to point out to the audience that uh, the chairman does not have a replica of Lucille in her office. Does, <laughs> okay. does not. That's quite an image. 
to give people. All right, time for two more questions, uh, Chairman. I would um, say, you know, the walking dead, that's very serious stuff. Thank you for whoever asked that. That's important. Um, as the Department of Energy fills out leadership slots, what kind of nuclear expertise do you believe is needed at the agency? You know, I have some Department of Energy Association, as did a former Commissioner Ostendorf, so I have quite a few insights about uh, some of the continuing expert staff at DOE. I, I offer a broad compliment to the Office of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. In the senior executive service there, they have a core of individuals with decades worth of technology development experience, and I have a really deep respect for a lot of those folks that I've known for many years. So I think, you know, the political leadership is more fluid, of course, across the course of time. And it is, as it is at NRC, as commissioners come and go, the senior executive service, longstanding agency agency experts that really provide the continuity. So I'm confident that the administration will pick people with, you know, a, a very uh, strong public policy orientation. I'm, maybe this is a bit a kind of a controversial view, but my view is at the highest political levels, you're really kind of doing more public policy or energy policy than you are. You don't need to be kind of out experting the experts at departments and agencies. They're still there to carry forward on that work. Okay. And so the last question for you this morning, Chairman. Uh, the NRC has been implementing uh, the AIM program to make NRC more efficient. Now that the uh, Trump administration is imposing additional cuts and regulatory reductions, what will be your approach, aside from your AIM program, to address these new objectives? I talked in my um, prepared remarks about my confidence in the NRC, and that wasn't just a platitude. I said it wasn't just what I thought, it's what I know. Uh, the NRC is an amazingly capable organization. Now, capability is not achievement. Capability is married with will, and then those two things yield a achievement. So I want to say, though, without capability, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to get where you want to go. NRC has been engaged in Project AIM. I don't see that as a negative in terms of overall drive within the administration maybe to look for greater efficiencies in government. I think it stands the NRC in very good stead that we've already been engaged in this type of effort. And truth to tell, even though Project AIM was created under Chairman McFarland's uh, leadership and has been continued by the current uh, commission, it's really a kind of a continuous improvement culture at NRC that even precedes Project AIM. And I talked about other administrations coming in and looking at making regulatory agencies perhaps more efficient and effective. So I think that it's really an ongoing thing. And I think, uh, you know, as I noted in my talk, we do have the Project AIM implementation underway. But the staff has a very firm commitment to continue to look for and implement uh, improvements to our processes. And that they, they've really taken ownership of that beyond anything that the Commission has directed them to do. So I think this, you know, NRC has an opportunity to really stand as a model for these types of efforts, partly because we had already begun to do this type of work, but partly because we do have this continuous improvement and continuous learning culture. And that's what I refer to as an evolving set of expectations for government. I think that citizens tend to continue to expect improved performance from departments and agencies. And the good news for NRC is that that's already part of our self-examination. And so I think we'll continue that journey you know, in the future as administrations come and go. That's uh, part of the, the, uh, the incorporated culture of NRC. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman Christine Savinicki.